This, this passage, Mark 6, 5, is um, something of, uh, I think it can make a believer um, think about some things that culture and Hollywood um, might give us instead of reading what it says. And so I just wanted to start actually with Mark uh, 12, 24. And in Mark 12, 24, Jesus is talking to a Sadducee who has related a story that they would use in those days. It's, it's an argument ad absurdum where he tells about a woman who's, um, whose husband has died and she's been married seven times. And he asks Jesus, um, so in heaven, um, whose wife is she? And the Sadducee intends for this example to be proof that God doesn't raise men from the dead. And Jesus' response to him is that he doesn't know, firstly, the scripture, and secondly, he doesn't know the power of God. And so what I would say to you is that right now, many of you, even as you are, even, even growing up maybe in the church, that you have made for yourself some decisions, um, your core beliefs, and maybe even you let somebody else make them for you. And so I would, I would hazard a guess that there is, some, there is some core belief that does not acknowledge the scripture or the power of God. And I think all of us can learn a lesson from these words. And I, and I defy you to look at Mark 12, 24 carefully because Jesus is talking to a Sadducee and in the presence of the Pharisees who are, who are trying to find fault in him. And when he says to the Sadducee that he doesn't know the scripture, I don't think he means this in an academic sense. He's not saying that the Sadducee has never examined the scriptures. That's not what he's saying. I don't, I don't believe. I believe that he's saying he doesn't understand the scripture. And this is something that time and again we see throughout the Bible that the Pharisees misunderstand the nature of God. They misunderstand the scriptures. It's not that they, the Pharisees, don't know the scriptures. They've studied them since their childhood. It's that they don't understand them. And the issue is that I think you should, you should acknowledge that not a little bit about how your life proceeds depends upon what you expect from God Almighty. If you think, for example, that God is just the creator, and he's not a comforter, then you're wrong, and you don't know the power of God. If you think that God is just someone um, that you love, but that doesn't love you, you're wrong, and you don't know his nature, you don't know who he is, you never understood it. If you think um, that he's just someone that you chose, then you're wrong, and you don't know the scripture, and you don't know the power of God, and he uses his power to save. That's what he uses it for. Um, and so, again, I would say we should, we should evaluate our core beliefs and bring them to the obedience of Christ and know in our hearts that God is powerful and that a lot of things, a lot of good, can come from, from that acknowledgement. So um, I'll start you off with an example of, of, what, of what God can do. Zechariah in Luke 1, we talked about it last, uh, last Bible study that I taught, we were talking about how the angel appeared to Zechariah, who was a priest, and he appeared to him in the sanctuary. And um, Zechariah was given a prophecy, and his response to the prophecy was, how will I know that all of these things will take place? How will I know for a certainty that they'll take place? And the angel made him mute. And my, my interpretation of what's happening here and why the angel makes him mute is because Zechariah, being a priest, should know the scriptures. And by knowing the scriptures and what, is, what God has done for his people over the years, he should know the power of God and that when God says that a thing will happen, that it will be done. And so I ask you not to do as Zechariah did, but that you would know one thing for certain and that that is God is powerful. Um, Luke 137 says, for with God, nothing is ever or ever shall be impossible. So the ability of Jesus, Mark 6, 5, 
this is uh, what I wanted to, this is my message. So that was all free. Um, so Mark 6, 5, it says, and he was not able, Jesus was not able to do even one work of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick, sickly people and cured them. One work of power all depends on the people. So is it that the people limited what Jesus could do, or did they, through not believing and not asking, did they limit what God would do for them in their life? So I say this affirmatively, you cannot limit God in what he can do. That's not, that's not within your power. But you can limit what God will do for you in this life if you don't ask him. So you can limit that, but you can't limit what he can do. And Jesus in Mark 6, 5 was the same Jesus, the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. He's always powerful, always capable of changing your life. But these people would not ask because they would not believe. So it's not that Jesus could not. It's not that he would not. You know that he's willing. It's that they did not ask him to do one work of power. So, God will not give you a blessing that you don't want. This is a part of our free will. So why is it that God, Jesus, continually asks people that he's about to heal, what would you have me do for you? It's not that he can't do anything. It's that he wants to know what you would have him do for you. So much of what happens in your life is dependent upon what you're willing to ask of God. And there's nothing too bold in faith to ask of him. But he would not heal you without asking what you would, what, um, in, in many cases, he said, what, what would you have me do for you? And I say to this that it was Jesus' respect for men's free will that made him ask this question. That, that Jesus would not give someone a blessing that they would not have. And so it's about free will. And I think also um, you should look at Hebrews 2, 2, 8, where it says, for you, um, God, have put everything in subjection under his feet, men. Now in putting everything in subjection to men, he left nothing outside of men's control. So we have free will. And the thing is that God does as well. And what does he do with it? God saves with his free will. Of his free will, he saves. James 1.18, it says, And it was of his own free will that he gave us birth as sons by his word of truth. So Jesus has free will. He came here of his own free will. He finished the work of his own free will. He gave up his spirit of his own free will. And he used his power to heal, to save. It was all his own free will. So what can Jesus do? He can fulfill the law. And he fulfills it perfectly. He can save you perfectly. So in order to understand what it means to say that Jesus fulfilled the law, you have to know what the purpose of the law was. And the purpose of the law was to allow men to establish righteousness with, and, and therefore enter into a right relationship with God. So the law was to allow men to establish their righteousness and therefore set their relationship with God back in order. We here are living without his presence, and the law was to establish, well, rather reestablish, God's um, life with us together. He was trying to let us back in. And so Christ has fulfilled that law completely. And if you don't believe me, look at Romans 10.4. For Christ is the end of the law, it leads to him, and its purpose is fulfilled in him, for granting righteousness to everyone who believes in him as Savior. So firstly, Christ perfectly fulfills the law, being who he was, perfect, unblemished, and he grants us righteousness. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. We need to do nothing for it. We believe in Jesus as Savior, and we're granted righteousness. The reason, in part, that maybe you have depression, you have these depressive thoughts, you have anxiety in your life, is that you don't know the Scriptures. 
and that you don't know the power of God. God can remove those thoughts. God can remove the anxiety. He has the power to do it. But have you asked him? Have you asked him and known that he had the power to do it? It says that only God can give perfect peace. Only God can give perfect peace. You can search for it wherever you like, but you'll never find it. It's up to him, and you have to ask him, knowing that he can do it. So look at, uh, look at Hebrews 10, 14. It says, For by the one offering he has perfected forever and completely cleansed those who are being sanctified, bringing each believer into spiritual completion and maturity. So when you say that Jesus rose from the dead, you are completely cleansed. When you say in your heart that Jesus is your Savior, when you say that, you are perfected forever. And I wonder if you know how long that is. I wonder if you know how long that is. How long is perfected forever? Does it last until the next time you sin? So what is Jesus able to do? Part of his power is to cleanse your conscience. He is able to do it. If you don't believe me, look at Hebrews 9, 14. How much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who, is, who by virtue of his eternal spirit has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our consciences? A, believer, a believer's conscience is clear. If you don't believe me, and you don't know the scripture, and you don't know the power of God, look at Hebrews 10, 22. Here it is again. Let us all come forward and draw near with true, honest, and sincere hearts and unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith. And I love the Amplified. It says, by that leaning, that leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence and his power, wisdom, and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty conscience. Paul doesn't think of himself, if you've read any of Paul's um, letters, he doesn't think of himself as having attained Christ-like character. And so I wonder if you think you have, and I wonder why that would be. And so uh, if you look at Philippians 3.13, he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, Christ-like character. But he does one thing. He forgets what's behind him, and he reaches out to the future. He puts all of his energy into forgetting the past, reaching out for this hope that purifies. And that is our, our hope in Jesus, our hope that we will be perfected and dwell with him in heaven forever. God will not remember your sins. And so I think you should make it your core belief. You should say to yourself, if God will not remember my sins, then I will not remember my sins. And I think you should get in agreement with God. God will not remember them. Why are you remembering them? God accepts me through Jesus, and therefore I accept myself. I won't reject anything about myself. I accept myself because God in his mercy accepts me through Jesus, so I accept myself. This should be one of your core beliefs. It's in the scriptures, and God is powerful enough to make it happen. So what can Jesus do? Um, the young ruler, many of you will be familiar with it. Um, Matthew 19 is where it's recorded. A young, a young Jew, um, a, a wealthy man, a ruler, comes to Jesus and they're discussing what it is that he needs to do in order to attain salvation. And the man makes it clear that in his heart he believes that he has perfectly fulfilled the law ever since he was a, a knee-high to a grasshopper. He, he, he thinks in his heart that he has done this and it comforts him. What Jesus says next, if you don't know the character of Jesus, if you read it in isolation, it can seem perhaps like he's condemning him. He says, one thing you lack. 
He says, give away everything that you have and follow me. And it says that the man left sad. He went away sad. He went away sad of his own will, right? He could have given away everything he had, but he relied on his wealth. He was actually in his heart relying on the things of the world for his salvation. He thought that if, if he just, you know, had enough, that he could rely on that. He could rest in it and it would comfort him. It would save him. And so I, I think you should consider that what Jesus does in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount is that he deepens all of the commandments. He makes them about the heart. He makes it not just external, but internal as well. He says, even if you've only looked at a woman in lust, you've committed adultery. And what he's saying to the young ruler is that he hasn't perfectly fulfilled the first commandment. He has not actually relied completely on God, and he is an idolater. He is, by his reliance on mammon, on wealth, on the things of the world, an idolater. He deepens the first commandment, makes it about his internal his internal state, his, the state of his heart. Who is he relying on? And so the, the man went away sad because he realized he had not yet fulfilled perfectly the, the commands. So was Jesus condemning the man? Did the young ruler get saved? Well, he went away sad that day. But wouldn't he have heard that Jesus was crucified? Wouldn't he have heard that Jesus rose from the dead? And having, and having heard it, he would understand, receive the Holy Spirit, and be saved. So really what Jesus was saying to that young ruler is, I alone can save you. Me. I alone can save you. You have not of your own will perfectly fulfilled the commandments, but I have fulfilled the law. So Jesus was actually offering the man salvation. It seems like maybe it was condemnation, but it's salvation. If you want to live under the law, that's fine. Just leave your car keys and your wallet here, and um, we'll, you know, we'll take care of it. All right? If you want to live under that law, if you, want to, if you want to see this as an additional commandment for you to fulfill, leave everything here. Okay? Um, your, your behavior needn't be perfect. Your fulfillment of the, of the commandments needn't be perfect because of Jesus. And I submit to you that even your faith doesn't need to be perfect. Look at Mark 9.23. The, this is the story of the epileptic. And the father says to Jesus, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, if. And Jesus says to him, you say to me, if you can do anything, why all things are possible to him who believes. All things. And when Jesus replied in this way, the, the father gives this inarticulate cry. And it it reminds me of the, of the part in the Bible where it says that, that God heard the cry of, the, of, the, um, of his people when they were building the pyramids. They were in agony. And there, there may not have even, even been an articulate prayer for deliverance from that suffering. But he heard them. And that's what this reminds me of. The man just cried out an inarticulate cry. He said, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And the boy was cured. The boy was healed. And so, Jesus, what was he doing? By healing the boy, what was Jesus concerned with? He wasn't necessarily concerned with the temporal affairs, the temporal affairs of, of the boy's life. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he cared, right? I'm sure he, I'm sure he loved the boy. But the important thing is that he was helping the father in his faith. He gave the father a work by which the father could have faith, and he would remember it all of his days and know what God had done for them, and be saved, knowing the power of God, knowing what he could do, knowing that he could save. So I submit to you that I don't even think your perfect, your faith has to be perfect. That Jesus, through what he has done, you can look at it, rely on it, know that he is perfect, that he's powerful, that he's willing, he's able to do it, and he's always working. He's always working. It says, um, Genesis 18, 14. 
Is anything too hard or too wonderful for the Lord? Mark 14, 36. Father, everything is possible for you. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is always working. Right believing is knowing that he's able, that he's willing, and that he's working. Um, John 5, 17. It says, My father has worked even until now. He has never ceased working. He is still working, and I too must be a divine work. How long is he working for? He's working till the last moment, to that last second. To the time that Jesus returns, he's working. He's working, he's never ceased working. If you don't believe me, Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. He's working until the last moment. He's not finished. He's not finished. And so often on the, in the Bible we're told about the length of time that someone has suffered under a condition. And the idea is that you should, you should understand that the years, that doesn't, that doesn't take away from his power. The length of time you have been praying for a thing does not determine whether or not God will or will not do it for you. So what can Jesus do? What's he, what is he able to do? He can save you eternally. John 10, 28. And I give them, I give them, it's a free gift, I give them eternal life and they shall never lose it or perish and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Romans eleven twenty nine, For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them once they're given. And he does not change his mind about those of whom he gives his grace. He does not change his mind about whom he gives his grace. Once it's given, it's irrevocable, and he does not change his mind. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, why is it that Jesus asks the question, what do you want me to do for you? I don't think it's as simple as to let everybody around know what's happening. I think that's part of it. But I think in addition to that, he wants to know what we are willing to ask of him. We, he wants to know what we're willing to ask in faith. So I want you to look at Mark 10, 48. Here, um, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, is sitting on the side of the road in Jericho. And he calls out to Jesus. He calls out to Jesus and Jesus stops. He heard him and he stopped. Something stopped Jesus in his tracks and it was just the call of a blind man. And the man, the blind man, Barty throws off his cloak, goes over to Jesus, and Jesus asks him, what is it that you want me to do for you? Jesus is God. Why would he ask a blind man what it was that he wanted him to do? He can do anything. Do you think he cannot perceive that the man's blind? Do you think he doesn't know it? So why does he ask? Because he would not interfere with this man's free expression of faith. He has all the power. He has all the power. He could do anything, and he lets him ask. And Jesus, he uses the power to wash the feet of his disciples. In this case, he uses the power to cleanse Barty's eyes and heal him and give him his sight back. And Barty didn't need to be told to follow Jesus. He used his eyes, and he followed Jesus. He relied on the work he understood what would happen, and he followed him. He didn't need a command to follow Jesus after that. It was just what was natural, having been saved. Okay, so what can Jesus do? Do you think Jesus can save the Pharisees? I think he can. And I think um, the verse that I'm about to read you has been misused misused, misunderstood. So I want you to listen carefully. Mark 3, 29. Truly and solemnly I tell you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever abuse and blasphemous things they utter, 
But whoever speaks abusively against or maliciously misrepresents the Holy Spirit can never get forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting trespass. And this is from the Amplified Bible. So, it sounds like Jesus is condemning some people. It sounds like he's laying down a law that condemns. But really, he's telling the Pharisees, even though now in this moment you reject me, later, when my work is finished and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell among you, receive it. Receive it. He's prophesying. He's telling them about his death, his resurrection, and that he will send the Holy Spirit to us. So he's actually telling the Pharisees that he will save them. This is actually an offer of salvation. It's not condemnation. If you don't believe me, look at Acts 3.17. Peter is talking to the Pharisees, and he's talking to um, the Jews in general, and he says, I know that you acted in ignorance, not aware of what you were doing, as did your rulers also. The Pharisees uh, and the Sanhedrin, they were the rulers. So he's actually, Peter is saying to them, the rulers, that I know that you acted in ignorance. Thus has God fulfilled what he foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ, the Messiah, should undergo ill treatment and be afflicted and suffer. So repent, change your mind and purpose, turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, that times of refreshing and reviving with fresh air may come from the presence of God. Peter offers the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, he offers them who rejected Jesus in person, he offers them salvation. He doesn't just offer them that their sins would be erased, but in addition, he offers them refreshing air, refreshing times, times of renewal to be born again. So, Jesus can save the Pharisees too. Romans 11:23, And even those others, the branches pruned from the vine, if they do not persist in clinging to their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to grant them, uh, to graft them in again. Okay, so Jesus says, I am the true vine. Who are those that are pruned from the vine? Those that reject Jesus. And this clearly says, having rejected Jesus, being pruned from the vine, even then, God has the power to graft them back in. So who are you condemning under this? Who are you condemning? When it clearly says that God is working until the last day. God is working until the end. If you have a son or a daughter or an uncle who won't come, who will not see it, who won't accept the truth, it's not too late. It's not too late. He's working. He's working even now until it's finished. And he has the power to do it. Even someone who has rejected him and been cut from the vine can come back in by the power of God. God has the power, Jesus had the power to raise not one, not two, not three people, uh, but three people from the dead. He rose, the, he rose from the dead, the widow's son at Nain. He raised from the dead, Lazarus. I want you to reason your way to this reality. Jesus rose from the dead. You can't do it. And I need you to understand that you need to rely on these works in order, to, in, in order to get the faith that you need to continue. And you can always have hope. This is the hope that purifies. We can always have hope, not that, not just that he'll save us, not just that we'll see him again, that he'll come personally for us, but in addition, that we can be assured that his goodness, and he, he is working to save all, that not one should perish. He's working to save all, all the time until the last, until the last moment. Let me, let me just end with uh, a couple comments about what you should do. I think that you should ask, and you should continue asking God, and there's nothing too bold that you should ask for. You can, you can come to him with everything. And I think that you should continue to persevere in prayer. I don't it doesn't matter how long you've prayed for it. I think you should continue. 
And I think that you should know when you pray that God has already given you the thing that you've asked for. That it is already your current possession. I just want to stop. Uh, I just want to close with a story uh, about an answered prayer. About answered prayers. Luke 17, 12. It says that Jesus saw from a distance ten lepers. And this is a picture to me. This is a picture of ten men who don't know the character of God. They don't know the character of Jesus enough to draw near. Jesus, in, Mark, in Matthew 5, at the end of Matthew 5, end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's coming down the mountain, and he touches a leper. He didn't just cure him, he touched him. A man who had probably not been touched for some time and needed that kind of comfort. And so when he sees these ten lepers at the dis- in a distance, and they call out to him, this is a picture of some folks, in my opinion, who, who don't know completely what Jesus is willing and able to do for them. They stay at a distance. For everybody else from, from society, they have stayed at a distance. Society has judged them and cast them out, so they stay at a distance. But God says, draw near. They could have come close. Jesus would have touched them. As it is, they called out to him and he said, go, show yourself to the priest. And, and they went. They had enough faith to turn and go. And as they went, they were cured. They were healed. Only one of the lepers returned to praise God for what had happened. So I guess I'm asking you, if, if one of your prayers was answered, would you acknowledge it and praise God? Maybe that prayer has already been answered, but you attributed it to oh, good luck. You attributed it to, oh, well, that was just the market cycle, whatever it was. So I think you need to ask yourself, having prayed and having, this, the, having seen something happen, you need to attribute it to God. And even if the first thing in your heart is the thought, no, that can't be. This can't be him. This can't be him alone. He couldn't have done this thing in my life. There has to be some other explanation. You need to worship him anyway. Praise him anyway. In fact, I think it's happened in our own church. I've been praying, and our pastor has been healed of cancer, not just of the cancer, but also of the pain, of the treatments. He's been healed. But I didn't see anybody fall on their face and worship God. Would you, would you praise God right now for what he's done for John, your pastor? <laughs> praise God. So, that's it. The sound of the strings, symbols and heart, we praise you, we praise you, with the timbrel and dance, and shouts to you.